as I was introduced, I'm Seamus O'Sullivan. I work for a company that's only a stone's throw away from here called John Crane, Ireland. And we're in the industrial estate for a long time. And I've just been reminded that before you do this, they say never drink more than one cup of coffee, and I think depends on six. So we should have a fast presentation this morning. This one is about the road to ISO 50001. And briefly, a quick word about who this company is. John Crane is a part of Smith's Group PLC, and Smith's Group are one of the, I suppose, a few genuine Victorian companies that are around. It was um, founded in 1851 and is celebrating 100 years of the South Exchange this year. There are five divisions uh, Flex Tech, Interconnect, Detection, Medical, and John Crane, which I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> so, John Crane. John Crane makes products and services for the global energy industry. We don't own any oil wells or gas pipelines, but we make so many things. Uh, in Shannon here, we make a, a thing called a welded metal bellow seal, which is quite a unique piece of mechanical equipment. Um, uh, we make a lot of underground rods, uh, drive couplings, all that kind of stuff. So the size of this division, 7,000 people, 1.25 billion, um, probably more uh, relevant to the size of the company in Shannon is in or around 100 people. And coincidentally, we are celebrating an anniversary this year as well. We're 40 years uh, in the industrial estate in Shannon. We used to be EG and GC law, uh, then we were taken over by TI Group and more recently by John Craig. So, uh, into the, uh, the topic. How many people here are accredited to standards like 9,000 or 14,000 or OSHAs or anything like that? Okay, two, three, four, right. So some of this will be uh, depressingly familiar to you. Twenty odd years ago, we accredited it to, to 9,000. <coughs> so the, the standardization bulk bit, and we, we started off down this trail. Uh, around the same time, uh, company SGS, the Swiss company there, um, something um, surveillance, uh, Society Generale de Surveillance in, in Switzerland. They had this precursor to ISO 14001 that they call the Green Dove. We accredited to that. A couple of years later, British Standards came out with 7750. We jumped on that one. And uh, very quickly afterwards, we accredited to EMAS, the Eco Management system in 95. Then spray on uh, 14,001 became a reality and we upgraded to that. So this was our, our portfolio of standards up to that point. Then there was a big hiatus between 96 and 2010 where we went through a couple of change of ownerships and I don't think anybody quite knew what to do with us. We were downsized, we were right sized, we were uh, moved around a bit. But by 2010 we were back in the saddle with OSHA 18001, which is the health and safety standard. Around the same time, coincidentally, we bumped into these guys, uh, Resource Graph, because we began to uh, recognize the importance and the cost of our energy. And uh, more recently, then, we started to 50001 in 2012. But I just want to take a step backwards now to that point here between meeting resource draft and uh, accrediting 50,001. So the, the question was, well, how hard can it be? Uh, we were looking at EN 16,001, which was the precursor to 50,001 at the time, and this was in 2011. We had now been doing en energy monitoring for two years, so we felt very comfortable uh, about what we were doing. We saved quite a lot of money. Uh, we had a good handle on our, our enterprise. Uh, the sections of the standard, those of you, this is why I asked this question, people who are used to looking at the, at the energy standard will, will see a familiarity of the layout and the type of things that they ask for you, management review and external audits and all, the, all this um, review jargon. So we said, okay, 50,001 looks like the other standards that we're familiar with. We, are, we have been monitoring our energy for a couple of years, so we're familiar with that. Uh, 
So why not formalize our efforts? Why not go for this consensus? And to help us on our way, uh, we uh, contracted a company called Antares to do a gap analysis certification uh, between where we were and what certification would be. They gave a great pitch. We were looking at a couple of other companies at the time. But Antares came in and they said, if you hire us, we guarantee that you will get to 2001. Okay? So we hired them and we got to 2001. Okay, from what did the gap analysis throw up? Well, it, first we found out that we had no corporate policy uh, for energy. And any of you, once more, who are familiar with standards will know that the first thing they look at is your policy. Does your policy fit what you're trying to do? So that began a bit of a toing and froing because we had to create a document that our uh, our higher ups would agree to signing off on. Energy was not integrated into our existing control documents. We have hundreds of documents on the system, on quality and environment and all kinds of other things. But now they would have to incorporate the word energy or concerns about energy in them. So we identified a big back trawl of energy, uh, of documents, if we were to do this. Then we needed to create a whole new set of documents, which would deal with uh, consumption planning and review, measurement and forecasting, and our procurement system would also have to row in heavily behind this. Uh, with regard to the purchase of energy efficient equipment, which would have to be specified in our purchase orders, requalification or future qualification of contractors, and justification of capital expenditure. So there was, there was going to be a big change uh, required if we were going to do this. But of course, when you're this far down the road, you're kind of hooked uh, to get drawn into it. Then there's the physical interventions. Up to now, everybody's just sitting around the table mm -hmm. and in the boardroom talking about it. But uh, in order to make this happen, you've got to get out into your facility and review the wiring layout. And if it, um, this is just purely on the electricity side of it, and I'll come to the other energy sources in a minute. But in order to get a handle on what you're, what you're using, you need to understand your wiring layout. Then there's all this. Um, soul searching and hand wringing goes on about correlation and you want to correlate the subboards that you're metering bearing in mind that we're working with resource craft for a couple of years so their meters are connected to our subboards and we want our subboards connected to something that we can <coughs> correlate to our production and when you've made that correlation you want to correlate the production then back into the energy unit consumption. So ideally, you want to be able to say, if we're forecasting that we're, make, we're making 10,000 of these, and next year we're going to forecast we're going to make 11, what is the impact on energy of making 1,000 more of whatever you were making? And that is the ideal situation that you want to be able to get back to. Uh, in this process, you have to recognize your legacy hardware uh, and requires a lot of communication and training. So you now have this new uh, key performance indicators are now referred to as energy performance indicators. And you have generated a whole new raft of things that you have to keep an eye on. So you, you break down your energy aspects, your electricity, are you using oil, are you using gas, uh, wind, solar, atomic energy, whatever you happen to be using has to be uh, identified. You have to certify your sources of information on this. So uh, for a lot of companies, it would be, you know, if you're just on electricity or gas, for example, your bill uh, or invoice will be a detailed document. But sometimes, in our case, for example, <coughs> we're using um, diesel for, for heating. And the idea of how much diesel did we use last year sounds like a simple question, but it wasn't a simple answer because there was lines for this guy and that guy and I don't know why. Uh, you need to design new data reporting streams that give a picture of energy performance. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, effort spent in trying to get a handle on exactly what you're, what you're doing and designing a system that will pull all this information together. Of course, you then need a, a 
management review to establish what your energy performance indicators should be. Uh, and you have to link the metering plan to those performance indicators so that your system is feeding you the information uh, that you don't have to uh, rejig too much data. You need to calibrate your, your measuring instruments, which is a weird one to me, because I use all the same, you know, the thing says five kilowatt hours, it's five kilowatt hours. But no, you have, just like a quality system where you have to, to calibrate and certify your, your uh, measuring equipment, you can do the same with this. And correctly uh, correlate the activity to the consumption. The last thing you got to do is establish an energy team. This is a new, uh, a new structure in the company because the energy team Will, you will depend on to do a lot of the, uh, the technical work. So this is a quick snapshot of where the energy team fits in. And the more I looked at this actually before I came here, the less sense it made to me. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> if I draw your attention to this loop here, which is familiar to any of the standards people, so you set your policy at the highest level. The local site then sets the objectives that are arising from that policy. Your management review sets your, your key performance indicators and your internal audit people make sure that you're on track. Everything else uh, goes back to this energy team. But the energy team puts the objectives into effect. They communicate the policy and plans to the workforce, police the system, and review and prioritize the energy opportunities. So what I've done so far is to, to just give you the, the mental change that has to occur before you get down to actually going with this thing. So I'll conclude now with a few um, flowcharts that will take you from establishing the baseline to deciding what you're going to do to reduce your energy to putting those projects into effect. So the first thing you got to do, we're, we're now on the wagon, we're going heading helper ladder down the the 50,001 path. And the first thing we have to do is to establish our baseline of exactly what energy we're using. <clears throat> so you, you start with your data, say from the accounts department or from the, the maintenance department, to find out uh, exactly what you were doing to review previous uh, consumption. That tells you uh, what you don't know as well as what you do know because you identify gaps from that activity. You then need to figure out what meters you have and if you're not already uh, monitoring and metering your energy at this point uh, then it's time to start seriously looking at doing so. Um, once you know what meters you've got and you know what your, your sources of energy are then you need to find out what you need, what's missing. Then you've got to get physical. You've got to go into the plant. You know, if you work in a small place, that's fine. You can just open the office door and walk out into the plant. But if you're in a business which has a large site or maybe multi-site, then actually finding out what's out there can be uh, quite a project. And by now, you should have a, an idea of what direction your energy consumption is going. Is it going up or is it going down? If you haven't been putting a lot of attention on energy up to now, it's probably going up. And that's, that is both from the kilowatt hour perspective of the physical energy, and also from the cost side. So you're, you're now at a point, well, have I got it all? Is this all of it? Have I got the full picture? Then comes your, your management review. You, you bring this to the management and say, well, this is a snapshot of of, uh, of the situation, what do you want to do? And everybody cogitates. Mm -hmm. Then we all make a, a group decision and jump over the cliff together and approve it. A management agrees it. So now you've got your, your baseline for moving <coughs> forward. So the purpose of all this is to drive down your costs in a systematic way. So like you might in a lean uh, type project on, in manufacturing, you identify your top users so you can attack them. So at the site level, you identify your devices, uh, energy consuming devices, and what function they play in terms of, of your manufacturing 
and if you have process maps, this is it's a huge uh, benefit to you uh, for tracking. Um, and again, you know, every situation is different. If this is being done by a very experienced person, they almost know instinctively what's out there. But if it's being done by a team or by a new group of people, they need to be they need to have something that they can follow a map. And also, of course, process mapping is a terrific way of, of looking at your process and taking costs out of it or departing energy. In this section here, then you're at, you're down to your subboard level. So you want to find out what what is being where is the energy going. From the subboards or from whatever uh, source it has, and at this point you will probably find that you need portable equipment, portable measurement equipment, to get a, a handle on exactly what each piece that you have identified is, is contributing. So now you're down to your top losses, the parts of the of the, the, the SEU, the significant energy users in of, of equipment that you've got in your plant. You need to then verify this, go to maintenance, go to engineering, go to wherever you need to go to and say, this is my list, give me a sanity check on this. Uh, and from that, you can then narrow down your project. So they will now focus on this, this, and this. And you repeat the, the process as necessary. Then down to the actual doing. This is all the previous uh, flow chart that we've done. And our, our goal is to Hit the low hanging fruit, so you apply your 80 20 rule. 20% 20 of the equipment has given you 80% of the bills and consumption. Uh, anybody ever see that great movie, um, LA Confidential? The character in us from coughing and says, Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. So, all you want is the facts to <laughs> so examine uh, and calculate what is being used. A rule of thumb, gut feeling, common sense isn't very good. Yardstick for this job. Remove operation spikes. Again, this is back to your scale of operation. You might find that while you're collecting all this information, that operations are actually running uh, a stocking program, or there's there's a demand spike somewhere, and they're doing things that they normally wouldn't do. So you have to make absolutely sure that the snapshot you've looked at uh, relates to ordinary regular business operations. Then you're back to the bean counters. You need a management and cost accountant at this point, or maybe it's going to be you uh, if you're going down this to estimate the potential saving and the cost implications of what you're, you're looking at doing. Now you come to the wider implications, and this is one that always kills me. You look at the safety, quality, and production impact of what you intend to do. Again, yeah, going back to my original question of people being involved in standards, your your every standard has a different flavor, and the but the general direction is down. So if you're in nine thousand and one, you want zero defects. If you're on fourteen thousand and one in the environment, you want zero emissions. If you're on OSHA eighteen thousand and one, you want zero accidents, <clears throat> and you kind of get lulled into the thing. If you're on fifty thousand and one. You want zero energy, but well, that's great. <laughs> you get your feet on the side of the street. So you, you've got to balance this, um, this standard more than any of the others. By now, you're getting a, the big picture. You've got a complete financial analysis of what you intend to do. You're down to the kilowatt hour to euro. You're down to show me the money. What is this going to say? Uh, 50,001 is an extremely numbers calculator intensive standard. It's all about uh, accounting, basically, whether it's money or kilowatt hours. Comes the decision, is it worth it? And uh, once that decision is made, you're immediately thinking of what your next project is. Now, where are your projects going to come from? They're going to come from a thing called the Register of Opportunities, which you're your team, your energy team, is, is gathering suggestions all the time, and you're you're, you're putting you're, you're building up a register from which you will pluck your opportunity, um, your, your project opportunities to go down this road. Finally, you've got to prove it because if if your own internal audit people aren't going to be on your case, then certainly your external um, people will. 
comes to, to auditing your standards, they're going to say, okay, you did all this, that's great. Uh, what was the result? Oh, we saved uh, 10,000 kilowatt hours. Prove it. You've got to be able to prove it. You make the change, you measure your success or lack of it, and, and you update the register or your, your system because you're going to have to. <coughs> So, uh, finally then, you have to think, is, is 50,001 right for you? Is it something you want to do? You have to first ask yourself, is this appropriate to my scale of operations? And as a rule of thumb, which I told you was a bad idea a moment ago, but here I'm going to use one, the bigger you are, the more appropriate it will be to your scale of operations. Because it takes quite a bit of effort and quite a lot of resources. Do you have senior management buy-in? Because if it hasn't, you're wasting your time. Are the resources to certify going to be made available? Are you going to be able to bring in a consultant to do a gap analysis? Are you going to be able to pull a team of busy people together from what they're doing to do all this other stuff we're just talking about? And even after you certify, are you going to be given the resources to sustain the effort? Because it's not just a case of getting the cert from the level of the wall and forgetting about it. You have to go through uh, every subsequent year, you have to produce the results of the, of the previous year's efforts. Now, there are many benefits associated with 50,001 uh, beyond the, the obvious. Uh, perhaps it, it's uh, beneficial to your corporate image, depending on what business you're in or what product you're selling. It could give you a marketing advantage. A new one coming up that, that I hear quite a lot about from your sister companies at the moment is the new EU carbon tax uh, regime that's coming in all across the EU. And this will, will cause companies to be uh, audited, but if you are 50,001 accredited, uh, you'll get a derogation from that. And finally, uh, it is a systematic and verifiable framework. You want, if you like system to systematize your stuff, you can, you can energy monitor will bring down your costs. If you want something that's verifiable and systematic, however, fifty thousand one is an excellent uh, way to do it. So that's me. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll be around for the morning if there are any questions. Are there any questions now? Sure. So, <coughs> I have a couple of questions. Sure. And um, because you developed different products and um, say so production lines different at different points, how difficult was it for you to make your matrix, your original matrix of understanding of getting the cost? cost? It was extremely difficult. And we never really cracked. <laughs> <laughs> so here we were in an old building, a building about six years old, that we had moved around in with this day and that day. So talking about electricity now, for example, which is one of the main energy sources. So we had all these subboards. Uh, up in the wall, and this subboard here uh, has that light, uh, this projector, and the kettle over there run out that subboard. This next subboard has these lights up here, the alarm the door, and a switch out there something. So it's an absolute nightmare to to bring down one subboard to say coffee, okay, or one subboard to say uh, presentation area. You know, if you want, if you want to break up your company into something meaningful like how much energy is the presentation area using or how much energy is the coffee area using. So it was very difficult. It costs a lot of money to rewire a lot of our stuff. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we never got it down to the, to the we, we got more work to do. And would it be easier to say start at a higher level just say ton of product produced in a year and break it down from the starting point to get started? And yes. Then bring it down year on year on year. That's part of the job. Yeah, yeah. Very, very good. You have to start somewhere. We checked about maybe 15 or 16 different metrics to try and get a correlation on, do a regression analysis on it. The one we got the biggest correlation on was whether the factory was open or not. And that may sound facetious, but it, it was down to how long we operated. If we were making one piece or a thousand pieces, it didn't seem to make it much of a significant difference to the amount of energy we were using. Interestingly, if 
say on a weekend or over Christmas when the whole place was shut down, we were using 10%. Uh, uh, we, we are using 10% now. Uh, previously, we could have been using 25% uh, of our energy bill just when there was absolutely nothing being done. But this, this is sort of monitoring, it's just a no brain of debt monitoring to see if we can do it. And the second question I want to ask you about is your energy team. Is that composed as a strata across the whole company from C level down to guys at the screen level? Or was it what way was it focused on doing? Uh, at the the driving end you needed EHS um, which was EHS and EE for the EE being energy tagged on to it, and maintenance was the other key point. We couldn't have done this without a big buy-in for maintenance. Then we took supervisors from each of the sections. Uh, and purchasing manager and operations to do the maintenance. And you don't see that, like, was it important to get money in a driving force and to be the CEO and to get the operations manager? Absolutely, yes, because they were signing off at the management reviews of what happened every year, what the forecast were going to be. They were also signing invoices when they would come in and say, we're going to have to rewire J263. What? Because you're shutting down production when you're rewiring. Site and CEO. On, on the corporate level, that was like saying, well, oh, they didn't have much of a, an opinion about 2001 two years ago. They got a big opinion about it now, and they were pleased to have it. They're, they're talking about uh, rolling it out across um, the 100 plus sites of the Smiths Group. Is that for our company possible? I'm not sure. They're, they've identified a gap in their whole energy policy. You know, they're, they're very big on quality, health and safety, and, and environment. And energy seems to be the blind spot for them. Now they're kind of playing catch up on it. But they're not sure whether they want to go for a full blown 50,001 implementation everywhere, or whether they're going to create their own sort of hybrid between 14,000 and a Smith's policy. One last question. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, right. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. so, so, obviously, uh, managing companies, you look at an ROI. So, yes. how many people permanently are involved in this? And, you know, on the journey, is it one, two, three years to get there? And how many people are involved to sustain it? And then, from where you were before to where you are today, yes. what's the return on investment? Are you saving like $100,000 a year? Or are you saving, you know, a million? or Know, from where you are, so and I know it's a hundred, you're about a hundred people, so correct. So. Okay, the, the, the ROI is, is the big question there, uh, which I'll take last in terms of people permanently on this. No one because everybody's got a half a dozen hats, mm -hmm. so you have to pull people together when you need them. It's good to if you can, if you've got a, an automated tracking system for it, like we have one for maintenance, preemptive maintenance, which we also piggyback. To remind us on uh, energy matters. So, if you've got a system that can prompt you, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, the people can go about their work and, and you can do it on an ad hoc basis. Mm -hmm. To get back to the ROI question, we had already saved all the money we were going to save by our association with Resource Craft for two years before we ever went near 50,001. Mm -hmm. We thought we might get a saving of around six or eight percent. Uh, by installing energy monitoring, I think the first year there was 24% for urban growth. Would we have been that inefficient? Yeah, we were. So, energy monitoring is an old brain, or if you never considered 50,001. So, when we came to do 50,001, if you like, it was all downhill because we had made our savings and we were now starting to generate costs around energy because we were bringing in all this infrastructure and additional analysis and formalization and ENPIs and all this stuff. So uh, there needs to be a compelling reason why you would go from just monitoring to the systematization of 50,001. Because you will get you will get your benefits from monitoring. So, so after doing so 50,001, you've done that, uh, when did you do 50,001? Two years ago, 2012. So, you put a lot of cost in, so the ROI on that cost? Oh, negative. Negative. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you think in two years, five year plan or whatever, will you get that back or no? No, not at all. It's, 
it's all going to be paid for by our, we are still, we're flatlined in terms of our energy saving. But of course, every business is dynamic, so you're going to get in. You're going to, your demand is going to change. Um, you're going to upgrade your, your equipment. There's all sorts of things that will constantly be manipulating your energy picture. So the, the systematic uh, discipline of 50,001 is going to help us to hold that. That's about the best way I can describe it. And if you're depending on it to stop things drifting back to where they were. If you're ever involved in a lean project, you know, you get a fantastic result a year later.